how the environmental deterioration, including illnesses, more challenged living conditions, would handicap the ability to lead good life, also to conversion disadvantages. The second remark I want to make is more complicated and I believe also more important. And since the discussion, and, and since the discussion here has to be short, I should perhaps take the liberty of saying that in my recent book, The Idea of Justice, I discussed this issue extensively, which I won't do today. Briefly, I would like to argue that even though living standards have been the point of reference in this presentation, there is ultimately a case to go beyond that to the kind of world that we may want to, that we may want to live in, not just only by our own living standards. Consider the literature on sustainability in the environmental field. The Brundtland Report, brilliant report, defines sustainable development as meeting, I quote, the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Brundtland's concept of sustainability has been further refined and elegantly extended by one of the foremost economists of our time, Robert Solow, in a monograph called An Almost Practical Step Towards Sustainability. Solow's formulation sees sustainability as a requirement that the next generation must be left with, I quote, whatever it takes to achieve a standard of living at least as good as our own and to look after their next generation similarly, unquote. The solar formulation of sustainability has several attractive features, but does it take an adequately broad view of humanity? I don't think Solo's uh, brilliant as the approach is, and Brundtland is brilliant too, quite does that. While the concentration on maintaining living standards or fulfilling needs, as Brundtland does, has clear merits, there's something deeply appealing in Solo's formula about trying to make sure that the future generation can achieve a standard of living at least as good as our own, it can still be asked whether the perspective of living standard is adequately inclusive. In particular, sustaining living standards is not the same thing as sustaining people's freedom and capability to have and safeguard what they value and to which they have reason to attach importance. One reason for valuing particular opportunities, sorry, our reason for valuing particular opportunities need not always lie in their contribution to our living standard or more generally to our own interests. It can, may right, lie in much broader values. To illustrate, consider our sense of responsibility towards the future of other species that are threatened with destruction. We may attach great importance to the preservation of species not merely because, not only to the extent that, the presence of these species enhance our own living standards. For example, a person may judge that we ought to do what we can to ensure the preservation of some threatened animal species, say spotted owls of some specific kind. There would be no contradiction at all if a person were to say, and I'm putting this hypothetical remark to the person, I quote, my living standards would be largely, indeed completely, unaffected by the presence or absence of spotted owls. I have, in fact, never even seen one. But I do strongly believe that um, we should not let these owls become extinct for reasons that have nothing much to do with human living standards." Unquote. We can have many reasons for our conservational efforts not all of which are parasitic on our own living standards or need fulfillment, and some of which turn precisely on our sense of values, on our acknowledgement of our fiduciary responsibility. If the importance of human life lies not merely in our living standard and need fulfillment, but also in the freedom that we enjoy, then the idea of sustainable development has to be correspondingly reformulated. There's cogency in thinking not just about sustaining the fulfillment of our needs, but more broadly about sustaining and extending our freedom, including the freedom to meet our needs, but not just that. Thus, thus we characterize sustainable freedom can be broadened from the formulation proposed by Brundtland or Solo to encompass the preservation 
and when possible expansion of sustainable freedoms and capabilities of people today. Quote unquote, without compromising the capability of future generations to have similar or more freedom, to use the same kind of formula. I finish by in invoking a medieval distinction, a European medieval diction, uh, distinction, in fact, which I have also used in my book, that we human beings are not only patients whose needs deserve consideration, but also agents whose freedom to decide what to value and how to pursue what we value can extend far beyond our own interests and needs. The significance of our lives cannot be put into the little box of our own living standard or our need fulfillment. The manifest needs of the patient, important as they are, cannot eclipse the momentous relevance of the agent's reasons, values. Sure enough, we have our needs, but our humanity can take us well beyond that. Thank you.